There is a grace to which the world itself does homage, and which those who bend neither heart nor knee before the world's Redeemer admit to be the consequence of his appearance among men. Heathenism as being impure and proud was consistently unloving. For as the one vice eats out the delicacy and heart of all true tenderness, so the other systematically enthrones self upon the ruins of the unselfish affections. Despite the utopian sketches which have been drawn by the philosophers of the last century, the sentiment of humanity is too feeble a thing to create in us a true love of man as man. Man does not, in his natural state, love his brother man, except it be from motives of interest or blood relationship. Nay, man regards all who are not thus related to him as forming the great company of his natural rivals and enemies, from whom he has nothing to expect save that which the might or the prudence of self-interest may dictate. To quote uh, Pinder from the Nemean Ode number one, Togar oikeon piese panthomos euthus dapemon cradia cados am philotrion. For such a like is whelmed by his own trouble but distress for a stranger's sorrow soon passeth away from the heart. Such is the voice of unchristianized nature. Man's highest love is the love of self, varied by those subordinate affections which minister to self-love, and society is an agglomeration of self-loving beings whose ruling instincts are shaped by force or by prudence into a political whole, but who are ever ready, as opportunity may arise, to break forth into the excesses of an unchecked barbarism. Contempt for and cruelty towards the slave, hatred of the political or literary rival, suspicious aversion for the foreigner, disbelief in the reality of human virtue and of human disinterestedness were recognised ingredients in the temper of pagan times. The science of life consisted in solving a practical equation between the measure of evil which it was desirable to inflict upon others and the amount of suffering which it might be necessary to endure at their hands. Love of mankind would have seemed folly to a society, the recognised law of whose life was selfishness, and whose vices culminated in a mutual hatred between man and man, class and class, race and race, thinly veiled by the hollow conventionalisms which distinguished pagan civilization from pure barbarism. How did Jesus Christ reform this social corruption? He gave the new commandment. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. But was his love merely the love of a holy man for those whose hearts were too dull and earthly to love him in return? Could such a human love as this have availed to compass a moral revolution and to change the deepest instincts of mankind. Is it not a fact that Christians have measured the love of Jesus Christ as man measures all love by observing the degree in which it involves the gift of self? Love is ever the gift of self. It gives that which costs us something or it is not love. Its spirit may vary in the degree of intensity, but it is ever the same. It is always and everywhere the sacrifice of self. It is the gift of time, 
or of labour, or of income, or of affection. It is the surrender of reputation and of honour. It is the acceptance of sorrow and of pain for others. The warmth of the spirit of love varies with the felt greatness of the sacrifice which expresses it and which is its life. Therefore the love of the divine Christ is infinite. He loved me, says an apostle, and gave himself for me. The self which he gave for man was none other than the infinite God. The reality of Christ Godhead is the truth which can alone measure the greatness of his love. The charities of his earthly life are but so many sparks from the central column of flame which burns in the self-devotion of the eternal Son of God. The agonies of his passion are illuminated each and all with a moral no less than a doctrinal meaning by the momentous truth that he who is crucified between two thieves is nevertheless the Lord of glory. From this faith in the voluntary self-immolation of the Most Holy, a new power of love has streamed forth into the soul of man. Of this love, before the Incarnation, man not only had no experience, his moral education would not have trained him even to admire it. But the infinite being, bowing down to self-chosen humiliation and agony, that, without violating his essential attributes, he might win to himself the heart of his erring creatures, has provoked an answer of grateful love, first towards himself and then for his sake towards his creatures. Thus, with his own right hand and with his holy arm, he hath gotten himself the victory over the selfishness as over the sins of man. We love him because he first loved us. If human life has been brightened by the thousand courtesies of our Christian civilization, if human pain has been alleviated by the unnumbered activities of Christian charity, if the face of Christendom is beautified by institutions which cheer the earthly existence of millions, these results are due to Christian faith in the charity of the Redeemer, which is infinite because the Redeemer is divine. And thus the temples of Christendom, visibly perpetuating the worship of Christ from age to age, are not the only visible witnesses among us to his divine prerogatives. The hospital in which the bed of anguish is soothed by the hand of science under the guidance of love. The penitentiary, where the victims of a selfish passion are raised to a new moral life by the care and delicacy of an unmercenary tenderness. The school which gathers the ragged outcasts of our great cities, rescuing them from the ignorance and vice of which else they must be the prey. What is the fountainhead of these blessed and practical results but the truth of his divinity who has kindled man into charity by giving himself for man? The moral results of Calvary are what they are, because Christ is God. He who stooped from heaven to the humiliations of the cross has opened in the heart of redeemed man a fountain of love and compassion. No distinctions within the vast circle of the human family can narrow or pervert its course, nor can it cease to flow while Christians believe that Christ crucified for men is the only begotten Son of God. It is therefore an error to suppose that the doctrine of our Lord's divinity, 
has impoverished the moral life of Christendom by removing Christ from the category of imitable being. Close quote. But on the one hand, the doctrine leaves his humanity altogether intact. On the other, it enhances the force of his example as a model of the graces of humility and love. Thus, from age to age, this doctrine has in truth fertilised the moral soil of human life, not less than it has guarded and illuminated intellectual truth. How indeed could it be otherwise? If God spared not his own Son, but freely gave him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall wonder if wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption are given with the gift of the eternal Son? Who shall wonder if by this gift a keen, strong sense of the personality and life of God, and with all a true estimate of man's true dignity, of his capacity through grace, for the highest forms of life are guarded in the sanctuary of human thought. Who shall gain see it, if along with this gift we inherit a body of revealed and certain truth, reposing on the word of an infallible teacher? If we are washed in a stream of cleansing blood, which flows from an atoning fountain opened on Calvary, for the sin and uncleanness of a guilty world, if we are sustained by sacraments which make us really partakers of the nature of our God, if we are capable of virtues which embellish and elevate humanity, yet which, but for the strength and example of our Lord, might have seemed too plainly unattainable. <laughs>